Fernando, you have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fernando Gon. I'm the Information Security Director at Edge Uno, and I will be speaking about the operational implications of IPv6 packets with extension headers, or expressed differently, the negative implications that we might have when, through our network, IPv6 packets are circulating that use options. Before going into the discussion of the topic, I would like to give you some background that will allow you to understand this issue. This has to do with a requirement that we often have in network devices, sometimes they're called intermediate systems or middle boxes. And this is to process layer for information expressed in another way. If we go to the basic case, which is that of a router, many people assume that these devices can only will only use or will only process to send packets. For example, the destination IP address, among other things, bearing in mind or assuming that the real internet network respects that layer principle. So in the network layer in principle, it would, we would only be processing values or fields or objects of network layer. However, there are requirements and the operational requirements and realities. Basically, in practice, we really have to break that principle of the layers so that intermediate intermediary devices, which in theory should not receive layer four information for carrying out that task, in practice, they do need this. They're going to need it. Personally, I think that this background information or this concept is the most important part to understand the rest. If this part is clear, then the rest becomes obvious. So I'm interested in writing some of these examples and mentioning these examples that we often have in the operational world, where we have layer network devices that need um, layer for information. One of the first examples is to implement ASL in infrastructures. Basically, this means that we want to implement filtering rules to protect our own network infrastructure. For example, we want to restrict what are the addresses that can reach the PGP port or CCH port in our network infrastructure. In many cases, this is not the only way to do so, but this can be done with infrastructure ASLs, ACLs. If we wish to implement filtering with great granularity, in other words, only filtering traffic that goes from a given address or given group of address to a specific port, we will then need to have access to the layer for information. What is a transport protocol? What is the number of the destination port? Something closely related to this is what is known as DDoS management and customer requests for filtering. We can use any telemetry tool and there's a DDoS attack that is taking advantage of a given protocol. So in some cases or very often, we'll try to apply filtering with the greatest amount of clientarity in order to affect the attack traffic. We need to access the layer for information, not only which are the systems that are sending packets, but also what services or packets this is addressed at. Another example that at the end of the day is closely related to this, it's the same thing applied differently. This is the implementation of the request of filtering for traffic filtering, customer request for filtering. 
And some of your clients, you see that they have a service that is exposed to the internet. You recommend to the client to filter that service, but for some reason or other, the client does not filter this or thinks they can, they can, he cannot filter it. Maybe he might ask this from us as operators to filter the traffic directed at one specific port, not at an address because they should remain without service, but the traffic directed at a given port. In that case, we once again have the need of being able to access the layer for information. Another case is what we call load balancing. There are several variants in this of this, but if we have a router that has several potential links that could be used for sending the packets, somehow we we'll try to balance the traffic. Now, normally, load balancing is not done at random because this would imply reorganizing the packets, and this then has implications on the transport protocol of DCP, for example. This then has implications on the user experience who's using that protocol and that application. So what people usually do is to re re forward uh, all the packets for the same flow, for instance, all the packets that correspond to the same TCP connection, for example, in the same link. Normally, the uh, way the link is selected by executing a, a hash function on some values that uh, provide a certain entropy, including, for instance, the level of transport uh, ports uh, of the uh, transport layer. And here again, we need to be able to access those uh, transport layer. If uh, the uh, um, if, if you can't access them, there wouldn't be a possibility to send the same flow of data through the same link, and that would have very negative implications. The most obvious cases, I think that uh, we don't need so many clarifications, but uh, to illustrate this is the implementation of a firewall rather than an, a cell that is more elementary. The, the, more than the ACL. The firewalls try to analyze the traffic and process packets, usually in minimum layers, at least the transport layer. As a matter of fact, there are several uh, um, firewalls that act at the up upper um, layers. If I want uh, the firewall to... Um, uh, I, I need to... Um, I may need to have access to layer four. And the, finally, the detection and prevention of uh, intruder systems that uh, try to analyze the traffic of the application layer. So what can we uh, uh, draw as a summary of this slide? Because maybe some of you expected a route um, or a needle box um, it, somewhere in the infrastructure of the network needs to forward uh, packets. No, it just needs to process uh, the uh, uh, address of uh, origin or destination. No, from an operational point of view, it's not like that. So here we have a challenge. We face a challenge that has to do with how you do or what happens when the in the IPv6 world you want to access layer four information. Here you have the syntaxis, the, the structure of an IPv6 packet. Here what we have a mandatory header, the, the extension header, the to the left and to the right, the TCP payload, that is in the end, what you want to transport. In the middle, we place other headers. They're called extension, extension headers, whose purpose is to allow uh, options when transmitting the packet. Those middle headers will be processed in some cases in all the intermediate uh, systems, the routers, for instance, that process the packets, while others, for instance, destination options, will be processed only in 
the end destination of the packets. Now, there are two things that you need to bear in mind when you analyze the processing of the IPv6 packets, particularly when you want to access the transport layer. The first is, if I start uh, processing the uh, IPv6 header, as I have nothing uh, aiming at the uh, final uh, payload, uh, GCP, I need to leap to the next hop by hop options. And from there, based on the length of uh, that header, I go to the next and so on. If you have a background in programming, this is something similar to a linked list. If you you start processing with the first module and then you note, and then you have to, uh, to hop to the different uh, until uh, um, until you get to the end. Now, if these packets are going to be processed in via software, Usually, this issue of having to be hopping from one header to the other has performance penalties. And obviously, that has a negative impact on the performance of the uh, machine. On the other hand, there is a, in devices that implement this processing in other types of architecture based on hardware, we won't discuss the details of what happens behind, but basically what they do is to copy a small part of the packet of the begin uh, in a uh, rapid uh, memory, uh, to, in a flash memory to do all the processing that they need. Of course, the flash memory will uh, have a reduced size and will be expensive. So there's a payoff, uh, an engineering decision. So uh, how much information is copied in that flash memory? So what, uh, I have two limitations at the end. In some cases, one, and in other cases, the other, and sometimes both. And there is a, the maximum length that I can process or the extension that I can process. What sometimes happens is that the processing of the extension headers in order to access the transport information finally has a negative performance uh, of the, the devices. And uh, uh, it could even be used as um, a vector for uh, deny of service attack and sometimes when the devices try to prevent that from happening and they say well the header chain is so long that i won't be able to process it and they face the decision of what to do whether to let the packet uh, uh, go or discard it or what so what many do is basically to discard those packets when they can't process them with a good performance they typically discard them what is the consequence of that well, discarding packets introduces uh, fragility and uh, makes uh, the traffic of information more unreliable. And as a consequence, as a mix of all of those things that happen, somehow we can see that with regard to the extension headers in IPv6, very probably um, they are going to be limited to what is known as limited domains. So maybe in the network of a provider. There are two things that we need to, to take into account, and this is the take home message. First of all, if you don't consider this and you're doing nothing about it, and you don't know what you do in your networks as to how to process these packets, maybe you have a, a DOS attack vector that is activated and you should mitigate it. And second, that if anywhere where you are operating or you are providing uh, services to client, you find that there are packets that are being discarded. Maybe they have options and maybe the packets are being discarded because of those options. And the last uh, message is these two references, these two RFCs that we publish with other colleagues and basically they are the product of seven years of work, very hard work, but basically they give in-depth details of what I just summarized in this presentation more in more detail. I don't know whether there are any questions. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you for your presentation. Now, Jaime will tell us whether we have any questions in the Q&A panel. So far, we don't have any. Very good. We encourage you to send questions and here in the auditorium too, if you have any questions. Just a few seconds more, please. Be brave. Now, Fernando, 
I want to congratulate you for your presentation. Well, obviously, uh, you might not have any presentations during my presentation, but you have my website and there and my mail. So if you have any questions, you can uh, send them and to the extent possible, I'll answer them. Excellent. Good. Hi, name. Thank you. Any questions? Muy bien. Entonces, You're welcome, Shane. Thank you, Fernando. 